Okay, before we even start, I know exactly what you want to say. Wow, Jeff, do you really need 40 whole minutes to analyze a minute and a half of credits? Yes! If anything, this video's a bit short. Chainsaw Man's first opening, Kickback, has rightfully garnered a ton of attention for its consistently incredible animation, copious pop culture references, and simply for being a straight-up banger. But there is so, so much more to this thing than any of you realize. The videos and Twitter threads you've seen breaking those references down, thorough though they may be, are just the tip of the iceberg. If Chainsaw Man's original story is a work of genius, then this opening is a work of double genius. A fusion of Tatsuki Fujimoto's unparalleled vision and the unmatched directing talents of Shingo Yamashita, who previously crafted the similarly stylized opening to Jujutsu Kaisen, which this one totally blows out of the water, hiding subtle hints to future events and a few galaxy brain dirty jokes in the lyrics of that banger, the context surrounding those references, individual frames of that incredible animation, and even the timeline of the opening itself. There are so many layers to this thing that I had to split this video into layers too. In the first, we'll run through the individual shots and references to see what they mean on a surface level. Then in the second, we'll start connecting dots between those out of order so you can see the true brilliance of this opening structure. Then, in the third, we'll dig deep into what the opening secretly has to say about some of the manga's heaviest spoilers. Now, that is a lot to unpack, and this video is long enough as it is, so let's just jump into it. <laughs> The first shot of the OP depicts Denji pulling his start rope in front of a fancy old painting of some sort of devil. Manga readers might think they recognize this image at first glance, but it's actually not the Paradise Lost illustration that appears in that one chapter. Rather, it's an illustration from Dante's Inferno, depicting a sinner as he escapes from a bunch of demons who want to chop him into bits into the relative safety of a lake of boiling pitch perhaps symbolizing Denji's initial promotion from working for the Yakuza and getting murdered by the zombie devil to the slightly less horrible life of a public safety devil hunter. The painting's appearance in episode two as Denji heads out on his first job reinforces this reading. The movie references start rolling and will not stop anytime soon as we cut to a sweeping time-frozen crane shot of our besuited heroes doing their best Reservoir Dogs impression as they stroll through an empty city intersection in Tokyo. With all the dynamic reflections, the shifting camera focus effects, and especially how the light plays on both the environment and the 3D character models, these two shots feel like a huge flex on the part of MAPPA's compositing and effects team, but they also convey the basic dynamics of the cast very effectively. Denji and Power are big goofballs, Aki is way too serious, and Makima's here to keep an eye on all of them. As time resumes, Denji's eyes drift toward her, and his blushing grin conveys his crush to the audience perfectly. The montage that follows introduces us to an eclectic collection of Fujimoto's mostly Western filmic influences, from Texas Chainsaw Massacre to Jacob's Ladder to Constantine, while simultaneously serving to introduce the Devil Hunters of Tokyo Special Division 4, who didn't appear in that first shot. Every one of these shots is very impressively animated for how fast they go by, but with how fast they go by, you can't expect them to convey all that much hidden information. Having no-nonsense badass Kishibe take the place of Pulp Fiction's jewels or the violence fiend stand in for Anton Chigurh is pretty straightforward. Some do need extra context to parse, like I haven't seen Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, so I can't really tell you what that one shot says about Aki and Denji's relationship. But in other cases, even if you don't know exactly what has Denji horrified and power laughing in the J-horror cult classic Don't Look Up, that shot still tells you a ton about their personalities. The shot lifted from Attack of the Killer Tomatoes conveys what an under-budgeted circus the public safety office is, whether you've seen that cult classic or not. And while few would call the April Fool's joke about Freddy vs. Jason turned actual cash-grab crossover Sadako vs. Kayako 
any sort of classic. The one shot they steal from it is a pretty cool way of reframing Chainsaw Man's first clash with Katana Man as Akane slips away. The montage also does some really interesting framing with the lyrics of the chorus playing under it. Doryoku Mirai, a beautiful star, or Hard Work, the Future, a beautiful star in English. The shots that appear with Hard Work and the Future are all related to devil hunting work in some way, while each refrain of A Beautiful Star is accompanied by a shot of one of Denji's friends. After the film reel's finished, we find ourselves, appropriately, in a movie theater, along with most of the devil hunters, who we see in a jump cut, long take shot that conveys a ton about their personalities through extremely characteristic characterful animation. Power thoughtlessly stealing Kobeni's seat, then lecturing her and chugging her candy cup as she sinks to her knees in defeat, is both peak power and peak Kobeni. As that's happening, Himeno is clearly bored with the movie and takes Power's nonsense as a welcome distraction from it, but she's distressed to find she can't get a reaction out of Aki while he stares overly seriously at the screen. Denji and Makima, meanwhile, are both totally into it, sharing light commentary about the movie over popcorn with the sequence ending as he happily munches on a kernel that she feeds to him. Then a tumbleweed rolls by for some reason, transitioning us to the bowling alley from the Big Lebowski, where Denji gives his ball a referential rubdown and Aki a jealous stare down for his perceived status as Makima's golden boy. Aki, for his part, stays perfectly calm and collected as he rolls a perfect strike with his golden ball, and an obnoxious bowling alley motion graphic brings us to the most important part of the OP, the show, and all of anime and manga as a whole, power posing sexually in her beach bikini above a heavy metal logo of her name, which uses the exact same color palette as the Thor Love and Thunder logo, which is most likely intentional considering that Fujimoto's a huge YTT fan. The OP zooms and enhances to show Denji getting his walkies for being a good boy on the beach behind her, but then he's swallowed up by the grasping jaws of the snake devil. This transitions us into a shot of Akane and Katana Man in human form looming over Tokyo, followed by the gun devil's ammo belts looming over some mountain range somewhere. Given that this is the second allusion to it in the OP so far, I think it's safe to assume at this point that MAPPA plans to end Chainsaw Man Season 1 with the Katana Man arc. Jumping back to Denji, we now find him working in the library with Makima late one evening, then suddenly cut to him resting on her lap in the setting sun as she gently strokes his weary head. In this beautifully animated moment of bliss, Denji imagines plants blossoming all around him, a common trope in romance anime, but usually it's flowers, not fungus and Venus flytraps. But then Denji is a weird, gross dude, and his love for Makima has sucked him into an extremely dangerous and violent job, so these twisted symbols do make sense if you think about it. Next, we see his POV as he reaches out to Makima, only to be stopped by an unexpected wall of water right before reaching her. There's a really clever double entendre in the lyrics here, which roughly translate to, I want to hold it in my hand, what's inside your heart? This obviously reflects Denji's desire to be loved by Makima, but the Japanese word they use for heart Mune can also mean chest or breast, so it's also a reference to his driving motivation as a character, he really wants to touch some boobs. Indeed, if we watch the motion of his hands and the camera in that shot, it's exceedingly clear exactly what part of her he was reaching out to. And in the following shot of him waking up, his eyes linger there again before rising to meet hers, with a shot of the chainsaw slowly extending from his nose-bleeding face, not so subtly suggesting that some other part of him might be rising too. His eyes are so focused on those, in fact, that he doesn't even register that the snack he's opening wide to gobble up is in fact a gross little weirdo snail thing. Yet another reminder that his 
heavenly life of daily toast with jam comes at a steep and potentially deadly price. This sequence is intercut with shots of Makima using her fingers to line up a shot of her own, like a director scouting a location. She is, after all, the director of the Devil Hunters, who have an important job to do, and whatever feelings there are between her and Denji, her primary interest is coaxing him into action as Chainsaw Man. Happy to oblige, Denji erupts out of an apartment block window and into a big, crazy fight scene against a devil that looks like a ringed upon donut with legs. A scene that is insanely gorgeous and kinetic in its animation, even for this already impressive OP, though sadly I can't credit any of the animators who made that happen because those bits haven't been added to Sakugaboru as of this recording. He lands a clean hit on the beast, shearing off part of its chain arm and opening a geyser of blood from its back, but it stays standing and quickly dodges Power's follow-up blast of blood, launching into a counterattack of its own. Aki dodges, but Denji's sent careening into a series of apartment blocks, leaving a C-shaped impression in the last one's wall. The S and M that follow both complete the title acronym and imply that our heroes are continuing to get their asses beat. But Chainsaw Man always gets back up, no matter how hard he gets beaten down, and to impress this upon us, the scene briefly flashes back to a gorgeously messy abstract reinterpretation of his first fight with the zombie devil, showing him bursting through its mass of churning flesh and spraying blood, unleashing a bestial roar over the death of Pochita before reversing to his human form. This also seems to be a reference to Ava Unit 1 going berserk and bursting out of the angel Leliel, the moment in Neon Genesis Evangelion where most of the principal cast and audience first becomes aware of just how monstrous the titular mechs really are. Chainsaw Man, meanwhile, has made that much obvious about himself from literally minute one. As Denji gets back on his feet and Power cowers up a light pole, our hero suddenly spies a reference to the hideous corporate art installation that the Project Mayhem boys used to smash up that <laughs> shitty coffee chain in Fight Club. And noting its resemblance to Aki's golden bowling ball, he has a sudden, mind-blowing, galaxy-brained epiphany about how to use it. Though what's really galaxy-brained is how the shot of this epiphany reincorporates Power's silly motion graphic intro of the pins breaking and the camera zooming up into space to create the impression of a mind being blown with galaxy-brained ideas while simultaneously using a chromatic aberration layer to give Denji a third eye. This is one of the funniest shitpost edits I've ever seen in my entire life, and I'm literally a professional YouTuber. Denji whips his impressively detailed head around to face power, and her Nobel Prize aspiring brain instantly attunes to his wavelength and agrees to his brilliant plan. The animators continue flexing through the rest of this sequence as power hammers the ball, sending it careening down the street, reflecting the hand-drawn road behind it frame by frame as it rolls. And Denji, beautifully backlit as he rides atop it, leaps into the air and with the added momentum from the ball tears through the devil's defenses to mess up cracking an egg into a mixing bowl back in the squad's apartment somehow, which appears to confuse him as much as it does us. Get used to that feeling, because Fujimoto loves to play with his audience's perception of time and space and pull the rug out from under you right when you think you've found some footing in his madness. This break in the action kicks off a second montage of mostly unrelated one-second clips set to the chorus of Kickback, though this time, instead of references to movies, they're all direct allusions to imagery and events from Chainsaw Man itself or Tatsuki Fujimoto's greater body of work. The first of these is The Door, which 
any fan of the manga or anime should instantly recognize. The second shows the aftermath of the bowling battle with the Donut Devil, which is an anime original enemy, but the pose that Power strikes as she walks away from its exploding corpse exactly mirrors three different manga spreads that Fujimoto has drawn for Chainsaw Man and the one-shot Goodbye Airy, which I'm convinced he wrote solely as an excuse to practice drawing cool guys walking away from explosions. The third shot is simple and sweet, showing Denji and Pochita giving each other everything either of them ever wanted, a hug. But the one after that is quite a bit more complex and dark, showing Denji and Power as these happy, giggling innocents playing with Miaui and Pochita, while Makima and Aki stand above them, doing the hard work of demon hunting in the real world. This image is a reference to a widely shared piece of digital art titled, so far as I can tell, Ignorance is Bliss. It shows us that Aki has a much more adult, if cynical, view of the world than his partners, while from her position, Makima can perceive even greater, as yet hidden, evils lurking in the world. Following that, we see the future devil dancing, because he loves the future so darn much. And then a lantern blinks out as the ghost devil fades into existence behind it, a reference to the cost of unleashing its full power. Interestingly, this is the one time in the opening that the lyrics of the chorus perfectly sync up with the visuals. Over Doryoku, we see the devil hunters working hard, over Mirai, the future devil, and then that lantern is clearly a beautiful star. The last shot of the montage shows us Katana Man doing one last menacing pose in front of some swinging blades to confirm that this season is, indeed, building toward his arc. Finally, we close out on Denji and Power doing this cute little goofy dance together as Aki stoically watches on, but he too eventually joins in on the fun with his own quirky little pose. The same hand sign that summons the fox demon, which then eats us, causing a glitchy transition to a clean black title card. This dance, too, is a reference, but not to the Mickey Mouse Club like you might have heard online. It actually references the 2002 song Soda Were Alive by idol group Morning Musume, which also happens to be where the chorus of Kickback was originally sampled from. In the original upbeat idol number, the refrain of hard work, the future, a beautiful star comes off as a celebratory cheer, but Kenshi Yonezu's deeply cynical reinterpretation interpretation ironically reframes it as a sort of nonsense motivational mantra the singer keeps repeating to push himself through a shitty, unrewarding life until he just can't fucking take it anymore and starts screaming it. Which is just the perfect message for this show. With that, we've reached the end of our reference rundown and the extent of what we can find without a more thorough, scientific analysis of the evidence at hand. <laughs> Identifying and sourcing the individual elements of an opening only gets you so far in decrypting it. To figure out what it's really trying to say, you need to step back and look at the bigger picture, as any number of factors, including external cultural ones, can add vital context that radically transforms the meaning of those symbols. Take, for example, the two golden balls that appear in this opening. A casual observer might assume that their coloration is merely a way to distinguish them to the viewer from other spheres in the OP and make Denji's flashback epiphany easier to parse. However, someone familiar enough with Japanese to know that gold ball, or kintama, is also slang for a different kind of ball, will see that very differently and thus understand exactly why Power is laughing so hard at Aki, even though he's clearly about to bowl a strike. And someone who possesses that knowledge, plus the free time to spend several hours staring at the YouTube timeline for this opening on loop, might additionally note that the lone boner joke in the whole sequence occurs right in the middle of those ball jokes. And suddenly, their third 
third eye will open, revealing that this entire opening sequence has been carefully constructed to conceal a giant, slightly lopsided digging balls. And you thought it was genius when Yamashita hid the outline of a human heart in the Tokyo Metro. Having made that connection, another fact suddenly becomes obvious. Aside from a bit of pre on the snake devil's jaws, all of the blood and other liquid splatter in this opening comes after the boner joke, starting with Makima's wink. What's more, the first thing we see after the first Kintama joke, Power's power pose, is also the first, but far from last, explicitly sexual image in the opening. Meanwhile, the first implicitly sexual image, Denji Lebowski polishing his bowling ball, happens right before it. And what happens before that? Makima taking the crew to the movies, followed by the bowling. In other words, date activities. Now, let's bounce back to after the first testicle, where, behind power, we can clearly see Makima walking our boy home, where she strokes him with her hands a bit, causing him to get all excited and then make a big mess. With this staggering revelation in mind, a manga reader might additionally notice that Almost all of the shots in this opening that directly foreshadow recognizable imagery from the manga, as opposed to referencing outside media or creating anime original imagery, occur after the second golden ball joke. In other words, structurally speaking, this opening can be divided exactly along its testicle jokes into three clearly defined sections. The date, the aftermath, and the post-nut clarity. But then, what of the golden balls themselves? We've barely touched on them so far, and I think they'd really like to be touched on. Is there more to them, though? Do they really hold yet deeper secrets? Ha! How foolish of you to doubt Shingo Yamashita at this stage of the video. Of course they do! Each time we see a golden ball, it's moving very fast to collide with something very hard. These nut shots are not just nut shots, they're nut shot shots. And any true blue Chainsaw Man fan can tell you that there are also exactly two plot essential scenes in the manga about dudes getting socked in the nards. One involving Aki, the other a certain devil. Thus, these two humble testicle jokes combine to impart upon us a vital truth about where the anime is going next. That after fighting many hardships together and bonding as true Nakama, our heroes will ultimately put their differences aside and defeat the final boss of the season the same way that Denji once defeated Aki. By kicking him really hard in the balls a lot. Don't believe me? Look a little closer at that cool guys don't look at explosions shot. Not at power this time, but at Aki. Zoom and enhance. Now advance one frame. See that? The devil's explosion clearly starts at crotch level. Just as Denji's Lebowski reference reinforces the symbolic meaning of the golden ball that immediately follows it, this shot makes it clear what the golden ball that immediately preceded it really represents. But wait! There's yet another layer. The song, Cool Guys Don't Look at Explosions, starts with Andy Samberg declaring that real men have the nuts to walk away. Thus, we can conclude, since Aki is clearly being a looky-loo, that he no longer has his nuts after that fateful battle with Denji. Think that's a reach? Think a Lonely Island meme song is a Western point of reference too far for this opening to hit? Maybe. But remember that image of Makima on the book stack? Yeah, it's not actually a direct reference to the original artwork at all, but rather to a meme edit of that artwork that adds a third guy on an even taller stack of books and a third layer of backdrop. So internet culture is clearly on the table for references in this opening. And that might also mean that the, uh, pondering donut devil might actually look like that. You know, like, uh, 
big gaping hole being pulled apart from either side on purpose. And if that is intentional, well, one, it would explain why it's so powerful, you know, since the name Donut Devil doesn't quite inspire fear like Anal Trauma Devil does, but also it would explain why the donut's legs are centipede bodies with human limbs. It's another hidden horror movie reference, one that, as of this recording, no one else on the internet seems to have found yet. Score one for the anime, Pope. Also, also, this explains how the devil dodges Power's blood attack by opening its sphincter, which a donut wouldn't have. Probably. Don't quote me on that. I, I haven't been to every donut shop. There are some other significant aspects to that devil's design unrelated to butts, but getting into them means diving down to the deepest layers of this OP, where the big game manga spoilers lurk. So if you're an anime-only fan, this is where we say goodbye. Seriously, the video's over for you. I'm Jeff Liu, professional shitbag signing out from my mother's basement. From here on out, this is where the real What's in an OP Chainsaw Man begins. <laughs> So, from this point forward, I'm going to assume that we're all on the same page when it comes to the Chainsaw Man manga, that being at least the last page of Chapter 97. And therefore, we all know that Makima is secretly the control devil who manipulates Denji and many others into doing a lot of really fucked up stuff. I will now dispense with the pretense of playing off all the obviously sinister shit about her in this opening which I did in part for the benefit of the anime onlys, because frankly, I worry that this OP is a bit too obvious and foreshadowing that she'd a big bad. It is kind of hard to tell though, as a manga reader who already knows what to look for, so uh, I guess if you ignored my spoiler warning just now, let me know how shocked you were to hear that about Makima on a scale from one to 10 in the comments. Do not post untagged spoilers, just the number out of 10 is fine. At any rate, if you are up to date with the manga, then you might already know what I was talking about in regards to the design of the Goatsy Devil. When Makima unleashes her powers, the puppets she controls are connected to her by chains and have these gross little meat halos hanging over their heads, which bear an obvious resemblance to the shape of the devil. So we can also take this whole fight as a symbolic representation of Denji's final confrontation with Makima. And looking at it in that light adds a new layer to a ton of things. The CSM he leaves in the pavement can be interpreted to represent the impact Chainsaw Man has on the world after humanity becomes aware of him and elevates him to celebrity status, which also weakens him because devil powers are fueled by the fear of their names. Power hitting the sculpture likewise can be taken to represent her role in creating an opening for Denji to strike back at Makima after memories of their friendship free the Blood Fiend from the Control Devil's grip. And the fact that Aki doesn't appear at any point between Denji getting yeeted and the broken egg shot can be attributed to, you know, how dead he gets in that arc. Understanding this also allows us to make an educated guess as to what exactly Denji is trying and failing to cook alone in Aki's apartment, even without seeing all the Tupperware in that fridge. And I think the fade from that to the door more or less confirms this interpretation, especially with the lyric that plays under it, I feel like I've forgotten something. Referencing the traumatic memory that was locked behind that door before Makima dragged it out. Now, to me, all that's pretty conclusive, but if you still need extra evidence, all we need to do is slow down that fade and zoom in on Denji's face. In the last seven frames of his confused head tilt, his eyes and mouth pop open just a little, as if he's suddenly realizing something. And then, right as the fade begins, so fast that you won't see it unless you're going frame by frame like this, his face falls into a sad frown. And now I'm going to put one of those on your face by pointing out that from this point forward in the OP, we don't see present Denji's face once, only Kid Denji back before he lost everything. 
Even during the dance with Aki and Power, the camera cuts on the very frame where Denji turns around, so he's never facing us, and the dirt on his clothes creates a further disconnect between him and his untarnished friends. And the reason for that disconnect is clear. Starting with Pochita, every single character alluded to in these last 16 seconds, besides Denji, is destined to die. Well, except the future devil, but the whole reason he's dancing is because his favorite kind of future is the one that just happened to Aki. There's also a hidden omen of death in the ghost devil shot. That lantern blinking out represents Himeno giving up her life to fuel the devil's powers. But of course, the most interesting and symbolically dense shot to unpack here is that of the false walls and stacked books. The snow on Aki's shoulders is an obvious allusion to his tragic final fight with Denji, but the pile of snow that he's standing on carries a little more symbolic weight than that. Makima is the only character in the shot standing on books because she's the only one with any real knowledge of the truth. Aki, meanwhile, has elevated himself to a state of partial false consciousness by willfully burying his inner child in cold cynicism, perceiving a bleak and hopeless adult world that is, in reality, no more real than the happy-go-lucky playground Denji and Power still call home. But by convincing himself that he knows so much more than them, Aki actually makes himself more vulnerable to Makima's manipulation. Keeping our focus on Aki as we pull back to the start of the OP, we can see yet more signs of the hold that Makima has on him throughout it. In practically every shot, no matter what anyone else is doing, he's just staring straight forward with this blank expression on his face, which could be him being very serious or a trance. It's particularly noticeable in the theater scene, where everyone but him in the front row is animated. And when Himeno notices how weird he's acting, she doesn't look at the screen that seems to have captured his attention, but rather back at the light of the projector, which happens to be centered directly over Aki's head, looking an awful lot like a halo. Another ominous sign can be found in that scene, quite literally an emergency exit sign, which Denji quite pointedly ignores as he turns to accept Makima's treat. Even the way Makima walks down the street carries hidden meaning. If you look at the crew's reflections in that first crane shot, Aki and Powers form an unbroken line following in Makima's footsteps, while Denji is set apart from the group, retaining his independence. As the camera pulls around, Denji is eventually pulled into her thrall too, but then, in the last frame, after the record scratch, Power's silhouette breaks away from the group. Aki's, meanwhile, stays connected to her the whole time. But of course, the most blatant symbols of Makima's mind control powers appear in her romantic aside with Denji in the middle of the opening. The fungus that grows on him, along with the Venus flytraps as she's petting him, for example, is parasitic cordyceps, which hijacks the nervous systems of insects in order to reproduce. And that freaky snail she tries to feed him has been infected with a green-banded brood sac, a flatworm that invades the eye stalks of snails when they eat bird poop, then pulses to imitate a caterpillar in order to get eaten and repeat that reproductive cycle. If you know what a zombie snail is, then seeing those pulsing stalks repeatedly match cut with Makima's eye is a near dead giveaway as to what exactly her power is. Makima's ultimate goal is to remove Pochita from Denji entirely and restore Chainsaw Man to his original glory as the hero of hell. And the way the OP foreshadows all of this is with that genius double entendre lyric about how Denji wants to touch what's in Makima's heart and on her chest, which is, in fact, a triple entendre about how Makima literally wants to rip Denji's devil-infused heart out. You see what I meant when I said this OP is double genius? Well, if you don't by now, that's too bad because I'm finally out of things to analyze, but thanks for sticking with me through this whole video anyway, I guess. 
I'm willing to bet most of you made this face at least once along the way, though. And if you did, I'm not going to be one of those YouTubers who says you need to subscribe to me for that. But personally, I would. At the very least, though, please let me know which bits blew your mind in the comments below, or if you think you found a clue that I missed. I'm Jeff Thu, professional devil hunter, quitting my job before it kills me. Later!